Okay. Well, welcome back to another Wednesday. I think we're getting close to the halfway point in our lecture series. I think we have like 12 weeks. This is about week six. And rotating, of course, between some end game strategy and psychology of competition. So this is our second time going back to psychology and looking at that aspect of the game a little bit. So as we go through today, not only are we just going to be looking at moves and things like that, but more importantly talking about the frame of mind that's going through the players and how we can apply that to our games. Today's main topic is when we're forced to defend. So when our opponent does something that puts us on the defensive, whether we're positionally worse, whether they have the initiative, maybe we're down in material, whatever the reason might be, we want to look and examine at how are we handling that? What's our state of mind? How can we make sure that we keep the right frame of mind and are able to find those best moves so that we don't just end up defeating ourselves? I think one of the most common things that I see in a lot of games is positions where maybe you're not that bad or you're only slightly worse. People get really down on themselves. They can't find good plans. They can't find things to do. And suddenly the position just crumbles around them and can turn really bad really quick. The first little example I'm going to show you guys comes from a game that I played here at the Jacksonville Chess Club, and it was out of a Rui Lopez opening. So White has a very sort of standard setup going on in the Rui here. Nice pawns in the center. He's just accomplished the move d4. The knight has already found a home here on f1, and my opponent has to kind of do something. This move d4 is creating a real threat of d5 and forking the bishop and knight. And this bishop is sort of running out of places to go already. It doesn't have a lot of squares that it can come to and do much of anything effective. So there's a real challenge going on in the center to black. And my opponent has sort of been piling up casually at this h3 square. You can see how his knight's looking at that, his bishop's there, everything is eyeing there. And he decided, you know what, I'm not even going to worry about the central threat. I'm going to go all out with the sacrifice. So, the big thing about this position is less about the tactics, which do of course matter, we always want to be calculating that, but what sort of things go through your mind when your opponent plays this move, right? Yeah? I would have taken the position first, so the knight is aiming at f2. Okay, so you, you might change up the order of things like that, but if we're the white pieces, we're just sitting here and our opponent plays knight takes h3, I don't know about you guys, but even when I've calculated things and feel pretty good about it, anytime my opponent plays a sacrifice, I have that little moment of, okay, what I miss? Right? Like, did, am I missing something here? Because he's sacrificing a piece. Am I sure that I did everything right? Is he not going to beat me right on the spot? There's also that little bit of hesitation, right, in the back of our minds. In general, when this happens, if it's out of the opening, if it's early, one thing to remember is if you've been playing according to those nice opening principles, play in the center, we've got plenty of that here, making sure your pieces are moving to better squares, the knights are coming to the king side, king safety, our king hasn't really created any weaknesses, yes h3 was a small lever that could be sacked on, but there's lots of pieces over here, plenty of defensive pieces for white's attacking ones. So we've followed all of those opening principles so far, and that sort of tells us we shouldn't be too afraid of this. If we've been following our typical diagram, our typical setup, we shouldn't be too afraid about something crazy like this. Well, of course, we gotta look at the specifics too. So should we take this knight? Is it okay to accept this sacrifice? What do you think, Brad? I think so, because um, once the, you take with your g pawn, and after bishop takes, you could just go knight g3, I think your king's pretty safe. Right, we've still got this knight as a defensive resource that can come out to g3. So let me go ahead and take the knight. When our opponents offer that sacrifice, like I said, sometimes we have that moment of hesitation, but don't be afraid to rise up to that challenge. Just because they offer it doesn't make it a good sacrifice, right? Just because they say, here's my idea, they still have to prove that idea. Now, sometimes it might be best to ignore it and do something else, but in this case, we're going to rise up, meet that sacrifice head on. So my opponent plays bishop takes h3 here, and he's got two pawns for the knight at least, but he's a little bit slow in getting more pieces into the attack. For example, he wants to play a move like queen g4, 
But is that even a real threat here? Now because of the 9G3. Yeah, 9G3 is going to defend that accurately. So really, probably what black really needs to do is play a move like F5 to try to get more pieces into the game. Um, he's got to start opening up some lines for his rooks if he wants to achieve anything of note. So I threw in a little in-between move here. I played the move D5. And this was basically based around the decision of, you know what, if things start to open up and I want to move some of my knights, my whole idea is just that I'm going to keep his knight from ever being able to come and join in this attack at all. By playing d5, he has to retreat it, and this knight doesn't have any good squares to go to anywhere near my king. So I'm just driving his knight back away. He played queen g4 first, and honestly, he told me after the game he just totally forgot about my knight on f1. He played queen g4 and was like, ah, I'm going to mate him. This is just mating two, right? But knight to g3, and we're perfectly safe over there. And now black is going to have to show some idea. Yes? Is the h-pawn push trying to attack the pin knight a real threat or no? So the h-pawn push seems like maybe the next aggressive idea, right? I'm going to try and unpin this knight. But the problem is I can attack your queen immediately by moving my knight. So I can play a move like knight h2 or knight g4. And your queen's not going to be able to maintain this pin long enough to get the move h4 in, because I can always trade it off. So like, let's say knight h2, for example. How is black going to be able to follow up? Because my queen is threatening to take on h5. So if you play like queen g6, queen takes h5, and you can't take my queen and maintain it. So that's what black would really like to do, but it doesn't quite work out yet. Other ideas, maybe f5 could be another try for black. But your knight is still in, on pre, and this also brings my bishops into the game. Even though you're trying to get this rook in, my bishop is defending this square as well. I don't think black is getting his pieces to any sort of happy places here. I think it's just white who's able to get more pieces into the defense more easily. So black went ahead and moved the knight away, and already we can sort of see that the attack is fizzled out. There's not a whole lot for white to worry about in this game. Um, I don't want to spend too much time going over the rest of this one, because from here, you're really just sort of playing up a piece, making sure that you're not letting black mobilize his king pawns too well. And one of the key, key things is control of this f5 square with the bishop and the knight and the pawn all controlling that, it's really hard for black to achieve a real active break with that f5 move, because we can just snag that pawn over there. Not to mention this bishop, which is supposed to be scary and menacing, is kind of locked out of the position by the queen. It really can't do very much where it is right now if you can't manage to magically put a pawn on h4. So big takeaway from that, is just don't be too afraid when you've got that nice sound position if you've done your prep you're following those principles even when your opponent throws those sacrifices at you take that deep breath calculate things out and more often than not you can rise to the challenge not every sacrifice is a good sacrifice right so now let's go ahead and look at a little bit more technical situation so in this scenario we're in a rook and pawn ending, and we're down a pawn, right? Black has four, we've got three. Now, does anybody know the theory on this ending? Yes. Isn't it a draw? It is theoretically a draw, yes. That being said, black is the one with the practical chances, right? We're going to have to defend. He's the only one who's going to have the option of pressing for a win. So what I want to do with this is go into a little bit of technical detail because this is a very common ending that you'll see in a lot of your games. And something that if you're in a worse position, a lot of times you can aim for this sort of ending. So there may be a lot more pieces on the board, bishops, knights, things like that. Maybe you don't really like how you're being stuck having to defend. If you can find a way to trade things off, you can even give up a pawn and go into an ending like this really comfortably if you know the technique to draw. So if you know the drawing technique, you should not fear being down on this end. So that's what we want to make sure you guys know. So 
Does anybody have any guesses? Or there's many moves that draw here. There's not necessarily wrong moves, but what might be a good move to start with for playing? Yeah. F3, draw now to activate the king. So activating the king is a key idea. F3 is not the best though. And the reason is that F3 is going to give this rook more access along the diagonal. It doesn't let your king, or along the flank, right? So it doesn't let the king hide behind a pawn to move forward. It's going to give the rook more control back this way. Yes? G3. G3 is very similar to what my suggestion is. And really, the order doesn't matter very much. I suggest to move H4 first. G3 is also equally as playable. But the setup that you really want to have is with the pawns on f2, g3, and h4. That's sort of the ideal defensive setup. And you're not going to push your pawns forward from there. You're going to let black come to you and prove that he has to make a decisive breakthrough. Now, why do I like h4 slightly better than g3? Well, the only reason for that is just I think it makes it a little bit harder for black to try to trade off the h-pawn. He's going to have to do h6 and g5 if he wants to accomplish that. And it stops him from maybe playing like h5 and h4 really quickly against g3, which could make a little bit more awkward structure. It's not something we have to be afraid of, but we really don't want black to be able to push this pawn to h3. Because if he does that, he might be able to get some tactics against our king. So h4 is just a way that stops a lot of Black's tactical ideas. It takes them totally off the table. So h4, let's say he plays h6 because, okay, he's going to go ahead and play g5 next, get rid of the h-pawn since those are known to be really drawish. If the h-pawn's his last one left, he doesn't really want that, so he'll try to get those off. g3, like you mentioned, and now we have this nice structure. And the reason why I really like this is once we put our king on g2, there's nothing that Black's rook can do to bother us. He can't check us from behind because our king controls all of the first rank, and he can't check us from the side because our pawn blockades perfectly fine from the side. So if Black does go for g5 here, now what should we do with white? Yeah. H5. H5 is possible, but what would we like if we can get all the pawns off, is it going to make it easier for us or harder for us? Easier. Easier. So why not go ahead and trade them, right? Yeah. Just h takes g5. Of course, we would rather that black be left with an h-pawn if we could help it, because it's really easy to draw against h-pawns. But we still have our nice setup. We have the structure we want. And we don't really want to let black play that move g takes h4, because now, if it separates our pawns, there's going to be more targets. It's going to be harder to defend. So we want to keep everything intact, nice and structurally sound. All right, so at this point, what I like to do next, we've made our structure, he's tip chipped away at it a little bit. Where I like to place the rook is one row ahead of the most advanced pawn. And then we're just gonna hang out there. The point of this is basically that black's king is not gonna be able to go in front of his pawns. And so the only way for black to make progress is that he's going to have to push his pawns forward. And we'll see why we want him to overextend those pawns, why we want him to push them forward. So the king starts coming up. We'll just put our king on g2 where it's nice and happy. Here comes black's king. And now we're just waiting, hanging out over here on the fourth rank, saying, all right, prove that you can do anything to break our defenses. So the black king comes up a little more, and we're waiting a little bit longer. Now black plays the move e5. So now that the pawn has gone in front of the king, again our goal is kind of to try to slow down black's progress if we can. We could wait. We could play rook a5 as well. I don't think there's any reason to do anything other than the principles we've said. So what I like about rook b4, is if black pushes this pawn, it's really not anything to worry about. Where is it going? And we can always even consider playing a move like king h3 and checking or things like that. Black likes to play g4 first a lot of times. This stops white from being able to ever push there. Rook comes back to a4, and now let's say rook d4. 
So now black's trying to make progress. Should we trade off the rooks? No. no. Of course not, right? So that's the one thing we don't want to do, is allow the rook trade. So let's go ahead and attack the backward pawn. Now we can start to see why we like to hang out forward, because if black doesn't move all of his pieces together, there's going to be weaknesses back behind him that we can target. So he moves it up, because if he moves the king back, it's not going to help make any progress. And now we're just going to pressure the backward pawn. So earlier, we put our rook in front to stop the king from going forward. Once the king comes forward, now we're going to tie him to the defense of the pawn. So the point is, well, now you can't move your king, or else we'll just take on f6. So let's say he plays like king g5. Well, we're just going to keep waiting on the sixth rank, because we don't want that king to come forward. And you might say, well, can't black push on and get this pawn? And this is kind of what we're waiting for. So once black starts pushing these pawns too far forward, our defensive idea is going to be to keep the rook flexible on the back and the side. So there's one more move we can make before playing the rook to b7. That would be perfectly playable here. But I like rook b5 a little bit more, because the point is this pawn is hanging. If you play rook f4, it's not going to help you make any progress. If you play your king back, I'll just check you, and I'm happy to repeat, because all I want is a draw. So, okay, let's say he checks, we come back, and maybe the king tries to come around another way, attack the pawn again, and now he's going to use his rook to interpose. So check, and rook d6. So black's having to make a lot of moves to try to make any forward progress. So. Now we just put pressure on the pawn again. <laughs> what are these pawns doing? There's not a lot of good places for them to go. If he ever pushes this pawn, we're more than happy to take it and then bring our rook to g5 and attack from the other side. All right, so he's going to try again. These are just showing a couple different tries that black may have. Let me check. He comes here. And the slight difference from before is this black rook is on d5, whereas before it was on d4. So we can't put pressure on the pawn from the side. So what's our main drawing idea here? Is it rook b7? Should we go b7? b8. Rook b8. Always as far away from the king as possible. The point now is that we're happy to just check this black king from behind all day long. And if we ever get the chance to gobble up a pawn, we can do that as well. From this point, there's really no good way for black to make progress. His best try is going to be f4. Of course, if he plays e4, it just ends up being totally locked. So f4 seems like the best shot, and we're just going to take it. And after e takes f4, now you can see that we can just check all day long on the back. If the king ever runs to the side, what move shows the draw really easily here? Yeah. Um, rook e8. So if rook e8, black might try maybe rook e5. It still transposes, but what do we do after this? Rook g8. Rook g8. And this has the same effect on the other move as well. You could play rook g8 first, or you can play rook e8 and then back to g8. The key is just, do we want to trade those rooks? No. No, keep the rooks on the board. Yeah. Um, I suppose a minute ago when we traded the g pawn and the f pawn, I suppose that was to stop black from uh, treating himself and then letting uh, him check on the second rank. So sometimes he could trade and check on the second rank. The one thing you really want to watch out for in this structure, though, is if black can play f3. F3 creates a lot of tactics for him by locking you onto the back rank or the side. Um, and then he'll try to round up his rook, <coughs> attack this weak square, push the E pawn, and then he'll get a protected pass to F3 pawn, all that sort of stuff. So that's the one thing you really want to avoid when you make this structure with the F2, G3, H4, is you want to make sure black doesn't get a pawn to either F3 or H3. That makes the defense much, much more difficult. So if you can stop either of that from happening, 
then you can just keep the rook behind and check all day. Not have to worry about any of the cheeky little mating tactics. All right, so got any questions on that one? Okay, now hopefully you'll be ready to go into all of your rook and end games down, down a pawn, right? Be ready to draw down a pawn all day long. I would probably recommend everyone practice this because it, uh, I'm sure not all of us have gotten it 100% already. Yes, and there are some really good setups for that um, on chess.com now too. I think that you can find that in the drills feature now. They have one that has the down upon defense, probably in the end game section too. But they let you do all that stuff against the computer, which is really nice. Oh, this is my favorite. So now we're going to start looking for some more fun ways to draw. We looked at the technical way. We talked a little bit about mentality in here. But sometimes we just have to use the last ditch effort, right? Sometimes our opponent is getting ready to beat us and we've got to come up with one more try. And this is a fun little puzzle here. Black's getting ready to queen, of course. And I don't see any good way of stopping Black from making a queen. But we do have a way to try to save the draw. So what ideas might we use here to try to save a draw? Say black makes a queen, and then what are we gonna do? Check with the rook. Okay. Check with the rook. I'll move my king up. And then come back again. Check him again. Mm -hmm. All right. I'll play king c7. Then, then I'll play king c5. Yeah, we're gonna run out of checks, and then it's gonna be a queen versus rook. I mean, which isn't the easiest to win for black. But it is a known win for black if he plays the right moves. So king a7 is not quite going to work. We're going to have to find another idea. Do you have an idea, Rook? Yeah, yes, I do. I see it. Um, it's stalemate. So we play rook e5. So we're playing for a stalemate idea here. And so if you play rook b5, of course, I'm still going to go ahead and make a queen. If I make a rook, it's not going to be a win for me, so I still might as well make a queen, right? Oh, and then rook c5 check. And now rook c5. Oh, yeah. Once the queen takes the rook, e, no squares. <laughs> so, this is always something you can keep in your back pocket. You, a lot of times you see these puzzles and you think, ah, this will never happen in a game, right? I'll never actually get the chance to make a stalemate. But once you start getting fewer pieces on the board, you'd be surprised. And this next example comes from a Grandmaster game that will show us just that. Go ahead and flip it around here. This is a game that's really famous for this. It's between Alexander Beliavsky with the white pieces against Larry Christensen, who's known for being a very creative and exciting attacking player. Um, but Beliavsky is getting the better of him in this contest. So white has just played the rook to d7. I believe it was rook takes d7. And things look pretty bad. What's white's threat? What's he going to do after we move it? Um, rook h7, mate. Rook h7 and checkmate. So we are in a pretty desperate situation right now. Yeah. So what idea does Larry Christensen come up with in this game to see whether or not he can save it?
What you got, Dom? I think I, I think I found a perpetual check. Perpetual check? Not perpetual check, but a perpetual check that lasts, I mean, you can do rook h3 check. So rook h3, can't I just take your rook? Oh, <laughs> I did not. <laughs> I was looking at the rook after the king went to d, I did not see it. Until king went king d1, and then you can sacrifice the rook and then with the queen. That right, so that would have been good. Some yeah. tactics there, if the rook's not hanging yeah, out. Yeah, I not see <laughs> Sorry. But that, that was a good idea, though. What you got, Ryan? I think um, we take the rook with our queen, and then after he takes our queen, maybe we can just sacrifice, like, do the waterfall of pieces and try to go for the draw. So rook h2, king will take. Yeah, rook g2, rook g2. King can take. And, oh, nice. And you still have g5, right? Uh, not quite stalemate. Can you take the knight and try and do the same thing? So at the start? Yeah. So this is what Larry plays in the game. Knight takes f6, setting a little trap here. And Zelyovsky takes the queen. And now what? Yep. Water ball time. So which one are you going to do first? I think the rock on h2. I need a2. Good. Rook a2 to h2? Yeah. Alright, so rook h2, and mm -hmm. now how do you get the draw? Rook, rook g2. Rook g2. Rook h3. No, rook h3. If h3, oh, the king can get out to the side and start running away a little bit. Uh, the queen, if you do rook h3, then you get king g2, rook g. Basically, the the rook will eventually have to check on the f file, and then the queen can take it. Yeah, you got to everybody. So you've got to play rook g2. And actually, after the move, Rook H2, Belioski accepted the draw in utter disbelief um, and was not very happy with himself at that point. Now, bonus points in this, if we flip it around, after Queen takes F6, white to play and win. Oh. Is it rook h7 check? Rook h7 check. So sacrifice the rook, stalemate. eliminating that stalemate, and then you can take the queen. So that was the only way for white to win. Any other move, well, taking the queen would draw, and any other move would lose. So he had to play rook h7 in that situation. But a nice little resource we can always keep in mind. So even when it looks like we've got all these pieces left on the board, we've got two rooks, queens, sometimes we still have these sneaky little stalemating ideas. Um, so keep an eye out for them. You'd be surprised what you can find in your games. Now we're going to go back to the technical side of the world a little bit. Let's see, am I white right now or am I black? I guess we're white, we're just on the upper side of the board. <laughs> Now this is the rook versus bishop ending. This is also a known draw. But does anybody know what the simplest technique is to draw this endgame? Yes. Put your king on the opposite color corner as your bishop. Opposite. So why would you do that? Because um, it, I watched a video on it. But <laughs> videos oh. and 
um, your bishop can block on b8, and there's like stalemate tricks, I think. Yeah, if so I remember back. <laughs> the point here is that in the middle of the board, when things happen a lot, so let's say, let's make a few moves here. King d6, king comes over, let's go ahead and move our bishop. We'll play a check. And let's imagine that white runs to the middle of the board, right? Just for the sake of it. Ooh. Comes over here, comes here, and white gets ready to block with the bishop back here. The problem is that when black checks and we interpose, what can black do? What does black win here? Just kill a move with the rook, right? So rook g8 or f8 or e8, and now white's going to be in zoop swamp. He's going to have to move his king to the edge. We lose the bishop, and we lose the game. So the idea is that we're going to use the bishop to interpose, but we're not going to have anywhere for the king to run. So he can't put us in zoop swamp because we're going to be against the edge of the board. So we want to keep our bishop on the diagonal next to where our king goes. Just keep it dancing on there. And then we're gonna run our king over to that corner. So he checks, we're okay running backward because we know the technique. King comes up, we'll go toward the corner. A comes over, and we're happy to go to A8. This is very rare, right? Usually you're not running your king to the corner in the end game. That's usually the best way to get yourself in checkmate. But here it's not gonna work. King comes up, and now, what do we not do? How do we lose? Bishop c7. Bishop uh, king, c7. King, king b8. Or king b8, right? <laughs> king b8, and then we just get mated. So any move on the diagonal is fine. And after check, bishop to b8. And the point is that now, if black plays a waiting move, it's going to be stalemate. If black moves his rook, then we just put our bishop anywhere else on the diagonal, just the same. And let's say that black tries to give our king away out. Like, let's say he plays king c6, right? That's his only other real attempt at trying to do anything. Yeah. What is it the rook tries to get to the a file? If the rook tries to get to the a file, so that's kind of what black's setting up for here. He's moving his king so that the rook can swing around to the a file, right? If he just moves the rook, like, let's say rook to... Um, h8, we can just check the king, and then bring the bishop back, because if the king comes here, it's in the way of the rook, and if not, if it goes to the side, then we're still going to have outs. So if king c6, king to a7, and let's say he tries to swing to the a file that way, right? Now what do we do? Yeah. We can just go back to the corner, right? Just go back to the corner. Because our bishop blocks the check from here just as well as it does there. So we can use either diagonal the same way, whether he's attacking from the A file or from the eighth rank. So check, bishop's over here. And basically we're in the exact same position, just rotated 90 degrees, mm -hmm. right? We turn the board on the side and we've got the same. So the key to that, like Ryan mentioned, the king goes to the corner opposite the color of the bishop so that the bishop can block on the square next to him. And as long as you remember that, that will make drawing bishop versus rook really, really, really easy. Um, if you end up going to the middle of the rank, sometimes there's going to be some tactical tries the other guy might be able to do with that um, zoom swung idea. Yes? What if, what if uh, black plays a two? Like rook a2? Mm -hmm. Then, uh, well, he, it's not his move right now, but if he did, uh, what could white do? Nothing. Nothing, it's stalemate, right? Yeah. So any waiting move is immediately stalemate, right? That's the normal winning idea for black if you still have space to run with the game. Any questions on that before we go on? All right. So now that we've looked at that drawing technique, we're gonna take it 
one little level higher here and show the idea of a very minimalist fortress. We'll go ahead and flip this around. Looks pretty similar to the position before, bishop versus rook. Our king is headed toward the corner. But white also has one more pawn, right? So that makes things a little bit different, in theory. So can white win here? Is there any way for white to break through this fortress? squares for his king. So what square do we want to make sure our king keeps control over? Yeah? I think the dark uh, the H8 corner. H8, and more importantly, what square do we need to make sure his king doesn't go to? G7, right? If white can ever get his king to G7, then he'll have the path cleared all the way for his pawn, and he'll be able to push it up the board. We'll have to sack it for our bishop, and we'll still be losing the rook ending. So we can't ever let white's king get to g7, which more or less means our king is going to be confined to these squares. This is the sort of radius our king could possibly ever go in. Even here is kind of dubious. But our bishop we're going to use to keep the king from being able to help out either. So let's see what tries white can do. Let's say he plays rook a8, because we got to get the king off the back, right? So the king comes up to f7. If he checks us, we'll just go right back, so that doesn't make any progress for white. So how else can white try to control the h-file? Yeah. Rook a8. Rook a8. And what should we do here? waiting move. So we just want to keep that bishop on that big diagonal because we don't want white's king to be able to come forward. And now say, all right, show that you can move forward. Only real try is king to g5. And now what should we do? They've allowed king g7. Yeah, now they've let us play king g7. So if white lets us, we're happy to play king g7 ourselves. The rook has to run away. Another waiting move. And let's say he pushes. Of course, if he checks, what would we do here? Yeah. King AJ. Just go back. And we're basically in the starting position, except white has played king g5 first, so he's not making any real progress there. So let's go ahead and look at h6 instead, because this is the only real try that white can even have. And what should we do here? Mm -hmm. I'm just kidding, h7. Stay in front, so he'll check us. And again, the point is that we're controlling this square two times. And now we see why black's king is too awkwardly placed to be able to help. This bishop stops it from being able to move up to g6, so white can never play g7, and we can always shuffle back and forth back over here as well. So if he tries king f6, we can just dance back and forth king h8, and there's nothing left for white to be able to do. We're just looking at like okay, h7, um, But then you get the other. Okay. And 
and now we're in that position we looked at before, right? Just yes, that yeah, one. it's very similar to the one that we looked at previously with the bishop versus rook. That's what's nice about this one, is that basically you're already in the drawing setup when you're blockading this pawn. So a very minimalist fortress. One of the interesting things about this position, however, is that white actually would be winning if in the very initial position his pawn were on h4 instead of h5. But that has to do with getting the king space to be able to come out and around and triangulate. We won't worry too much about that. We're more just looking at fortress defense setups here today. Why do I show you these fortress things? Well, we've got a game for you here. We'll look at some of the highlights of this game from the World Championship match. And this was from five years ago between Magnus Carlsen and Sergei Karyekin. This comes from game four of the match. And this was a game where, if he hadn't already had the moniker, everybody definitely gave it to him after this game. Um, does anyone know what Karyakin's nickname is? Yeah. Minister of Defense. He's the Minister of Defense, yes. I think the tweet came after this game. There were a few guys who said, Vladimir Putin officially has declared Karyakin the Minister of Defense after holding this game. Now, we're not going to analyze every single move. We're going to start here on move 19 just to kind of show the position. The game goes 94 moves, so we could spend a very long time looking in depth at every one. But we'll talk about what sort of setup Karyakin tries to adopt. Now, the first thing to note is the material. Um, at the moment, who's up in material? Yeah. White's up in material right now, actually. He just took the spawn over here on h6. But who would you rather have in this game? And it may not be clear yet. It'll get more clear as things unfold. But why is black actually better here? I think he has more opportunities to pressure white. So, like, he has a lot of pressure on the E pawn, and eventually he'll have pressure on the B pawn. Um, and I'm not sure I necessarily see white getting any kind of attack. Exactly. So white has his pieces over here on the king side, but black is very solid over here. There's no real threats that he has to worry about of a big king side attack happening. Meanwhile, even though black has these double C pawns, they're more of a strength than they are a weakness because white's already lost his light square bishop. It's not so easy for him to target this c4 pawn. And because of that, this b file is just ready to be piled up on and black can go crazy attacking this backward pawn. Black also has a lot of pressure on that e4 pawn like we mentioned, already attacked three times. So he's already threatening to get the pawn back um, immediately on his next move. So the first question, is should we try to defend that pawn? That's a good question. Because <laughs> I wouldn't have thought of that question. Yeah. I think yes, because it's central pawn. So how would we defend the pawn? Knight d2. So we could play knight d2, maybe knight g3, but what's black going to do? to this position right now. Black didn't take this bishop on the last move because there was a little bit of recapture going on over here, so we made the decision to recapture on c4 first. But our bishop's still hanging, so we don't really have time to defend the pawn. So that is going to fall back, and now, after the recapture, it's a lot easier to see that black is unwinding, right? His pieces are coming to life, white's pieces are all hanging out by his king, not doing very much and this diagonal is very strong. So we'll go ahead and go through a few moves here. 
and get to the next sort of interesting position. So the queens do manage to come off the board, but now that we've advanced a little bit, what do you think about the position now? How do you like one side or the other? Yeah. Black. Black just looks pretty good, right? Why is that? Because um, the B file is just going, I see a crushing attack. There's so much pressure on this B file. White has defended it. So this bishop c1 idea sometimes can blunt Rook's powers on the file, but of course the drawback is we can't ever move that bishop, right? The only real nice thing that Karyakin's been able to do is he managed to get both of his rooks out before his bishop got stuck. So that, that's a really big plus to being able to defend. Yes? And also White has the knight on h5. So yeah, this h2 knight, I don't know what it's doing. And what are even its prospects? If it goes to g4, there's nowhere good for it to go. If it goes to f3, a lot of these squares are covered. So we're going to have to take a long time to try to get this knight anywhere. And I don't see any great places to even put the knights for white's pieces. So we'll go ahead and see what he tries to come up with. Knight g4 is what's played in the game. Rook to b5, we see that pressure starting to pile up. f3. F5, and now Magnus is coming after him, right? He's starting to put some pressure on him. This was the other nice thing about rook b5. He's defending this pawn twice, so he can start to push. And then I start the game all over again. <laughs> that goes back to F2. Bishop e7, F4, and bishop h4. Interesting decision there, getting the tempo on the knight. Why doesn't Magnus decide to push this pawn here? Yeah. Because it'll block the diagonal? It'll block his own bishop then, right? So even though you get the passed pawn, the problem is his pieces start losing good places to go. It blocks the bishop, it blocks the knight, they start losing all of those nice squares. So he decides to maintain that tension and get his rook to be able to come into the game when things open up. Sergei goes for tactical defense here. So the knight comes off the board. Both knights come off the board. But what does this let Magnus do? How should he recapture here? With the pawn. With the pawn, right? That'll let him undouble. Now, he's going to throw in the intermezzo check first, and this is simply so that white doesn't throw in the intermezzo check and force black's bishop back. He wants to keep his bishop a little bit more active after the rooks trade off, and then undouble the pawns. So now we're getting closer to a true endgame at this point. Black has managed to get rid of the double isolated c pawns, and he has the advantage of the two bishops. There's a lot of pressure on this knight. This bishop's on the monster diagonal. It's true that material is equal, but I would much rather have this pawn than this backward B pawn. This doesn't look like a very fun pawn to have to deal with, right? So he puts it back over there, try to stop that pawn from coming up the board. And here comes the king. And we'll go through some moves relatively quickly here. Magnus offers the rook trade up, and we do go into the pure two bishops ending. Now the main challenge for Karyakin in this ending is finding a way to stop these bishops from being too powerful. He's going to have to play against them and try to negate one of them. The other problem he's got is all of these pawns are fixed on dark squares over here, right? He really can't push this guy, or he's just going to lose. And that really makes everybody be stuck in this formation, which keeps his bishop back here at home on c1. The only advantage to that is it's really hard for Magnus to be able to attack the base of the pawn chain. Because, well, he can't really get this bishop to c1 where it needs to go to be able to undermine everything. So Karyakin is going to try to construct a fortress as the game evolves, and we're going to see how he does that and where he places his pieces in order to achieve that. 
So first of all, he doesn't want that bishop to be at home on c1. We gotta keep it active in some way. If it just stays over here, the king is gonna be happy to walk up into the game and just keep putting pressure on everything. The king's gonna do that anyway. So how can he secure that bishop? Well, h4. In comes white, or black's king, rather. And does Magnus ever want to trade this bishop for this knight? No, no. no, right? It's going to lead to that opposite color bishop ending, and this bishop will never be able to attack these weaknesses. So that's one thing to bear in mind as we're looking at this. If he could trade, maybe, maybe this bishop for the knight might be okay, but he doesn't want to give up the dark square bishop for the knight. Knight comes over to h3. And bishop f7. A little bit of maneuvering and jockeying for position happens here. Bishop to e7, and now he's offering up a trade. Real quick, can you back up a couple moves? I missed some. Wait, hang on. What's going on tactically? So, black's sort of threatening to win a pawn. Yes, black's threatening to win a pawn. So white plays knight h3. Why does that defend the pawn? Because the last four bishop is ending, and you could have a knight fork and f4. Yeah, so if you play bishop takes h4, knight f4, and it is a trade, I believe. Yeah. Well, he can take the bishop. But I think it's more defensible for white. I think knight f4 is the best move there. Let me see if it says. Knight of Fortress is the right move there. It actually doesn't like king takes, so let's see. Or let's say king takes g5. Knight takes d5. So as true black's up upon, I think you just have a very nice established blockade. So it's really difficult for black to reroute this bishop over here and make any progress, is the idea. You can't move the king up because knight e3 is going to come and win the c4 pawn. And knight e3 or knight b6 is going to start picking off these pawns because black can't defend them. So you've got enough counterplay in that line. That's the idea there. So Magnus doesn't want to let white unwind and get an easy draw. So he drops the bishop back and gets out of any of those ideas. If the knight comes here, he's just covering all the squares. Now there is a real threat of bishop takes h4. So Karyakin decides just to offer a trade instead. And that's what happens. Bishop takes h4, bishop takes d6. Bishop comes to d8. And now that he's managed to activate his piece a little bit, and Black's bishop has come back from being in the position, he's going to be able to start trying to establish a little bit of a blockade. So if we're going to stop Black's king from entering the position, where ideally would we want our knight? Yeah. F2. Back on f2. Now if we put our knight on f2 now, he can bug it with either bishop b6 or bishop h4. So where does our bishop belong in order to limit black's bishop? C5. It's going to belong on c5, or more importantly on this diagonal in order to keep it out. So this is the sort of setup that he starts working towards. He starts with king e2, getting the king a little active. Now after g5, knight f2, like we mentioned, and we're preparing to establish the fortress idea. So king g6, and what move is going to give white a fortress here? Yeah. I think um, the computer is giving us all of the <laughs> G4. <laughs> I mean, the computer has a lot of different ideas here, but we want to talk more practically speaking. What are you thinking, Ryan? G4. If you play G4, can't black play F4 and get a protected pass pawn? But it keeps his king out. So maybe we can try to round it up. So g4 is what's played, and the point is it's more important to keep these pieces out 
than it is to allow this pass pawn. And you can only get away with this if you can secure the fortress. Because if you can't secure it, if black can trade off the knight, then he can win the pawn with his bishop. And then he'll be able to win rather easily. So you have to be able to keep the bishop from attacking the knight as well. So here black plays bishop b6 rather than f4 first. Because he wants to undermine that knight. Now how can we try to keep the bishop from capturing that knight after black pushes with f4? This is one of the star moves of the game here, in my opinion. It's a small looking move, it doesn't look that impressive, but I really like the idea, it's pretty cool. We talked about it a little bit earlier, right? We said we wanted the knight on f2 in order to keep the king from coming in. Where did our bishop belong? On the diagonal. On the diagonal. So how can we try to get our bishop to that diagonal? It should be five. And the point is black would like to be able to play like f4, bishop e6, bishop f2, and bishop takes g4, but he can't do that all in one move. <laughs> I mean, it'd be great if he could achieve all of that at once, but he just can't do it just yet. Black decides to play a5-2, he's trying to fix white's weaknesses over here and keep any targets from happening on a6. Yes? So isn't there like bishop takes knight and pawn takes pawn? And so if bishop takes knight, like um, the move before. Oh, yeah. oh, black, black has to protect the pass pawn. <laughs> if bishop takes knight and pawn takes pawn, the problem is you're in that bishop of opposite color didn't you? No. Oh. So black can establish a dark square blockade really easily here. I think he can even play his king to like e3. And then just put the bishop on g3. And there's not going to be any entry or way to attack. You can just dance his bishop back and forth like this all day. And nobody's ever going to come in. Because your bishop controls this and the king controls all these. So that's why he can't take it right there. He has to already have the bishop here. He has to be able to recapture and keep connected passers if he's going to go for an opposite color to enemy. So a5 is what he plays instead. And now the big move. We mentioned it before. Well, he doesn't do it just yet. <laughs> but he's going to bring that bishop to d5. So knight comes to d1, f4, and now bishop d4. Which is a kind of a counterintuitive move. We've been talking this whole time about how, well, Black wants to avoid the bishop of opposite colored ending, so this gives him a chance to trade and go into a straight up end game, right? Mm -hmm. And white would have three weaknesses. He would have a weakness on d5, a weakness on g4, and a weakness on b2. So why is Sergei not afraid of this end game? Blockade the F2 and blockade the F pawn. So knight can definitely blockade the F pawn. And from F2, because that dark squared bishop's gone, it can never be attacked, so it's always going to be defending over there. 
So what other ideas would Black have to be able to try to get in? Well, he's going to try to activate his king, right? To go for the other targets, because there's not just one weakness in this position. But there's quite a few of them. Where should the bishop go for Black? Probably on this diagonal always keeping pressure on the g-pawn, so if the knight does move, he can take it, right? Basically what's going to happen is let's imagine this bishop goes here, knight f2, and black starts trying to bring over his king, is we're just going to end up with a game where it's my king versus your king, because this bishop doesn't have any targets other than g4. So I'm going to basically use my king to keep yours out at any point in time. And that's all I ever have to do. So I can dance it back here. My pawns keep it from coming forward over here. Its only entry point is on this side. And I'll be able to keep you from doing anything over there. Bishop is defending that square. So I can always keep you out. The other thing, if black gets really aggressive and tries to run over here, what else can white do? Yeah. So the other thing is white could even play a move like knight e4 and try to win this g-pawn. Because black doesn't have a way to defend it if the king runs too far away to the other side. So he's able to get counterplay. If he gets two pass pawns, then he'll be able to win the day. If black pushes f3 in order to stop the knight taking idea, then we just bring our king back over in order to win it that way. We're back in the square, so we can capture this pawn. Well, not quite, because he can push it here and we're blocked out. But we can do it next move after the king comes over. And we're going to have enough counterplay to be able to hold. This pawn is passed, ready to run. The knight's going to be able to scoop these guys up and then get back over and even sacrifice himself for the last couple pawns. So that's why he's not worried about this trade over here. There's not enough targets for the light squared bishop, and there's only one way for black's king to get into the game. Uh, yeah. oh, I have a couple questions about that. So, okay, so after... Um, Trade bishops and um, uh, yeah. So after say king f six, knight f two, or whatever you had, uh, yeah. Um, can't black just move his king to d five and then how does white defend? On? So I come over here, uh, king c three, and then like. Black just makes waiting moves on the day, so bishop e6. If bishop e6, I get that counterplay. Oh, I can't go there because the king's in that square. I can go this way. Mm. So, like, takes, takes, f3. Mm. And you bring your king back. And e. You may even be able to do the counterplay idea first rather than moving your king. So let's say he plays king here. I think I can just play like knight e4 right now. Because my king's defending f3. So rather than trying to bring my king over to defend, I just trade initially when you go for this. So just take, king takes t4 and I'm blockading the square there. We don't have an entry there just yet. What about, like, what about on the bishop's hanging? Yeah, so <laughs> you can't do that either. Okay. So what about, you say black plays bishop b6 first. Okay. Okay. And then, so I guess white, where's part, white's part in this kingdom, like, c3 or something? Well, once the bishop comes to e6, you could consider bringing your king up to, like, e4. Okay. So, hmm. That's tricky. 
maybe you can even play knight e4 check here. Because if the king comes back over, he's just not making any progress closer. And if he goes back, then you could take. What about king f7, king g7, king g6? So here, there, knight f2, king f7, you're saying? Yes. King g7, now I'll start bringing my king in. And then, uh, check. Oh, and then the knight. Okay, so bishop d5, check. And then. Okay, so white seems to have slightly more resources than it might appear. Yeah, and the problem is that this pawn's on a dark square. If black could more easily defend this pawn, white wouldn't have these counterplay resources. But because he's sort of tied, something is going to have to defend it, or they're just going to have to allow a trade which gets closer to drawing, white has enough resources. And then my other question was, instead of knight f2, uh, instead of knight f2, I was thinking, what if, or I, I had an idea for an alternate mm -hmm. setup where, say, white parks his knight on c3. Okay, okay let's say bishop b3. Okay, so king, f, king f3, okay. and then, we're basically kind of reversing where the king uh, is defending the pawn. As opposed to the knight? Yes. If I remember, it was a few minutes ago, I thought it was knight c. Let's see, go there, knight c3. That stops any of the checks, so let's go ahead and drop back. Keep the knight out a little. <coughs> the king can probably get more active. But you can't go too far because the pawn will start running. Well, bishop pawn's hanging there. So maybe just a check. And just dance back and forth there. Because now you're attacking this one, so he probably has to hold it. If he runs this way, you're taking one check. I wonder if that's a draw as well. That may very well be used too. That may be even simpler. I'm guessing, like, um, I'm guessing white has a lot of ways to draw, maybe. Yeah. And these guys are much better at this than I am, so I'm not too worried that they saw the guaranteed draw here. I'm pretty sure the computer evaluates it almost dead even, just about here. It likes that setup more with the uh, king on f3. But in either case, Magnus said, I'm not giving you the easy way out. I'm going to keep the bishops on the board. It's always something they can do here, and it's well known that when you have the two bishops, you can just make your opponent suffer forever, constantly trying to find some way in order to keep breaking down defenses eventually, um, just by keeping them on the board. That's pretty much what he does. So white's going to establish that blockade, but now we do have that setup that we were aiming for before. Knight's on f2, pawn's on g4, bishop is stopping anybody from undermining the knight. And suddenly, Black's bishop doesn't have anything good to do. It's only looking at its own pawn. There's no diagonals, no way for it to get outside of its own structure. And it's really hard for Black to make progress. So we'll go kind of quickly through some of the moves here as Magnus tries to maneuver and find anything to do with his pieces. Sergei is just waiting. He's got his fortress. All he's doing is moving his king back and forth. And so Magnus says, I'm going to go ahead and do what I believe you mentioned earlier was the only way for the king to come in was all the way over here on the queen side. So slowly over about 15 moves, here comes the king. The problem, though, is that even after all of these moves, it looks like Sergei is holding on by a thread, right? He's defending this b2 pawn. The bishop is cutting him off. After the king comes in and king to c1, what resource does Black have now? How can he stop from moving the king? Yeah. F3 and trying the bishop to F4. Black 
accomplish with that form. Problem is white. How come how come white isn't in Zoog's long hair? What resource does white have? Yeah. I think just really the bishop along the the G one A seven diagonal. The bishop's on about as good of a square as it can be right now. You could keep it on that diagonal. That works. But the other thing is this bishop right now is cutting the king off. And if black uses it for that, he can't do that and pressure your g4 pawn. So white can also just move the knight in this case. Because if black reroutes the bishop to attack the pawn, then he can just dance his king back and forth. So he still has ways to move, lose moves, even though it looks like he's very close to being out of them. Bishop d3 was tried, trying to get that pass pawn in there. Sergei says, nope. King a2, and now black's going to have to prove that he has another idea, or else white's just going to keep his fortress knight on f2. So, the only other try, Dom mentioned it before, is for black to eventually play f3. Only way to try to break through, right? Bishop drops back, and now we're pressuring the pawn as well. And white decides, I'm going to let you have it, if I can be able to make a decisive breakthrough. He's also looking at checking down here, and making me run out of squares. King goes to c1. Dancing some more. Now bishop f4. Can we take this bishop? Hmm? We're kind of, we kind of have to, because there's not a lot of other ways to deal with this. If we move the king, we lose the b pawn. If we move the bishop, he takes the bishop, and then after the king moves, we lose the b pawn. And if we defend with the knight, then he can just push his pawn forward. Bishop is pinned, so we would have to take. He can make a queen. So bishop takes, g takes, but now black's got these doubled pawns. The knight stops them just fine. The bishop can never kick the knight off of this square, so white is going to be able to keep the draw. Game goes on for a few more moves. They dance around a little bit more, but nothing too exciting from this point happens because the knight is holding all those entry squares. He does eventually give up the last pawn just in order to liquidate the position. And now we've got a lot more straightforward draw at this point. Or what is it? Why did white push a4? Why does white push a4 here? He's just stopping this pawn from coming in and loosening up, and he's stopping this king from ever coming back around and into the position, because now he's controlling so, both of these squares. The okay. bishop can't target a4 and defend c4, so he's okay. At this point, he's like, it's all right if it's a target, because I'll just win the c-pawn, if you ever try to take it. And the king can't attack it from any angle. So your only other try would be like putting the king on c5 and then playing the bishop back to try to defend it. And even then, after the bishop takes, then you can play king f3, take this pawn, and you still have two pawns against two. So that's a wild one. Lots of crazy defensive resources in that. But a nice example of even when you're losing, even when things are grim, because black was better pretty much this entire game the whole time. This was about 90 moves of just playing brutal chess for Karyakin and holding a draw at the very long end of it. It's boring to look at these things sometimes, but we find ourselves in that position a lot, right? Not always going to be better. We don't always get to press for the win, and we have to know how to use all of our resources to muster up against our opponent. So let's go ahead and wrap up with one more fun little tactic here today, and then we'll call it a day. Black to play and win. This is a nice little puzzle here. What I like about this puzzle is it's a very nice mixture of both, you know, those typical tactics puzzles. Oh, you're going to play and win a piece or win or whatever it is, but also watching your defensive resources. If you don't see the defensive resources in this puzzle, 
It's not going to work out. What you got? Bishop captures with c3. Bishop takes c3. This first move, I don't think it's too terribly difficult to find, but we're setting up some nice fun tactics, right? If you take with a pawn, you're just going to lose the rook. And we even have some ideas of like queen takes rook, and if queen takes rook, we can play like rook takes pawn and pin the queen to the king as well. But white isn't going to let you do any of that. No, we're going to play e6. And now white is coming after your king. He doesn't care about your little knight over here. He wants to play checkmate or make a new queen or both. in this one. It's not a brute force meat and potatoes tactic. <laughs> the real question of this problem is how can black find a way to stop this pass pawn? King uh, f8? King to f8. Weird looking move to have in the middle of the tactics problem sometime, right? Especially moving your king into the danger. We don't think of this a lot. We go, oh, we shouldn't move the king towards the danger. But if white plays e7, what do we do? King e8. Just king e8. And now white's pieces are blocked by his own pawn. That pawn's not going to make the queen. Yeah, question. What if black took the pawn? With the... What if white takes the pawn here? No, what if black took the And queen takes rook. You mean here, like uh, bishop oh. takes d4? E. F takes E6. The B pawn? Rook takes B2? Mm -hmm. F takes E6. Mm -hmm. Which move are we looking at for black? The F pawn takes Oh, you're saying F takes E6? Then I think the queen is taking with shit. And then the king goes Oh, there's mating ideas here. So, where do you move your king? If F1, of course, E8 is going to be mate. So if you go h7, queen here, now you're getting mated on e8 as well. If the king goes back, rook e8 is mate, and if you play g6, then just queen f7, rook e8 mate. So f takes e doesn't work. You've got to establish that blockade with the king. We know e7 doesn't work. What if he tries e takes f7, tries to open up lines? Yeah, right. Um, I think it's now the queen takes rook idea works. Now we can go with the queen takes rook idea. Because now after queen takes, queen takes, rook takes, this pawn has no more future. The queen can't come down and deliver checkmate. And we just get a nice little bishop. <laughs> Black wins. <laughs> All right, any questions before we wrap things up here today, guys? OK, well, hopefully you've enjoyed going over some defensive positions. Hopefully this will let you take some ideas away from it. Defense isn't always the most exciting concept to talk about in chess, but it's always good to study a few resources as well. So we have um, 
Fun chest for the rest of the night. Stick around, play a few games, bug house stuff next door, whatever you want. Have a good time.